1957, the apse of the church of San Martín at Fuente Dueña became a long-term loan to the Metropolitan Museum. The apse at Fuente Dueña really conveys the best characteristics of Romanesque architecture that one finds throughout Europe. The stone has a great warmth to it, and there's a real massive solidity to the walls, which those of us who love Romanesque architecture respond to, and I think you see it very much here in Fuente Dueña. This is both an aesthetic object, an interesting piece of architecture, and a historical document. And so we really value the apse in all of those areas. Today, the vestiges of the Church of San Martín de Fuente Dueña appears like a romantic ruin on top of a hill. It has towers half ruined, jutting into the relentlessly blue sky of Castile. It has a wall that clings to this steep escarpment above the modern city. With Fuente Dueña, we're very fortunate to have film footage of the dismantling of the apse, the very careful process that resulted in the apse coming here and then documenting it being reconstructed here in New York. Adding the apse from Puente Duena to the cloisters which opened in 1938 and already existed as a very complete and successful museum was really a great completion of this jewel of the Metropolitan Museum. The Cloisters is the Metropolitan Museum's branch devoted to the art and architecture of the Middle Ages, which opened to the public in 1938, but had its beginning with the purchase of a collection known as the Barnard Collection that belonged to a sculptor and dealer named George Gray Barnard, who had amassed a large group of mostly architectural elements from the Middle Ages, but did not include a major element from an ecclesiastical building. And then in 1925, John D. Rockefeller Jr. enabled the Metropolitan Museum to buy the Barnard Collection. He gave the land for the Cloisters and Fort Tryon Park, in which the Cloister sits in northern Manhattan on a very high site overlooking the Hudson River. And Rockefeller also paid for the construction of the new museum. People enjoyed coming to this wonderful site and having a sense of what it was like to be in a medieval building and to look at medieval art in an environment that suggests the way works of art were seen and appreciated in the Middle Ages. There's really no other museum like that. An apse is a projection at the end, usually the east end, the liturgical end of medieval church buildings and was a fairly standard element of medieval architecture, distinguished usually by its curved shape and often by a half dome vault. And that's where the altar is. It's where the, the focal point of the function of the church is, the service is performed. The Romanesque period, beginning in the 11th century, moving mostly through the 12th century, was the period when monumental buildings made of stone really re-emerged as a major form for European art and architecture. And the apse at Fuente Duena is a marvelous example of the Romanesque period of the 12th century. From the very beginning, it, the founders of the cloisters hoped that a large apse, such as the one we see here from Fuente Duena, could be part of the complex of buildings, part of the cloisters museum. And in fact, they were interested in the apse from the church of San Martín at Fuente Dueña, which was attached to a very badly damaged and neglected building in Spain. Fuente Dueña is on this extraordinary precipice in the heart of Old Castile. Old Castile is considered by many to be the very heart of Spanish identity. You have to imagine the 11th century Iberian Peninsula as a place that was completely fragmented. In the north, there are these feisty little Christian kingdoms who are fighting for sovereignty between themselves. In the south are a number of Islamic kingdoms who are sometimes allied with the Christian kingdoms, sometimes fighting against them. And in the middle is this broad swath of land which is uninhabited, a real wild no man's land. The strategic location on the road between the old lands of Old Castile in the north and the new lands of Castile to the south. Then at the end of the 11th century, a great king, Alfonso VI, manages to conquer Toledo, which was a great prize for his kingdom, the kingdom of Castile and Leon. Now how do you resettle a piece of land like this in the 11th century? First, 
you donate pieces of that land to monasteries. Because a monastery, once it establishes itself, is a good place to begin a settlement. Monks can provide local authority, they can provide a certain amount of security, and then settlers come with grants of land and grow up around this. These villas would be found on high plateaus overlooking fertile plains. Fuente Dueña is the perfect example of this. You can imagine how this frontier represented a kind of opportunity. Spain didn't have the same kind of feudalism they had in France. One could find a new piece of land and start a completely new future for oneself in a place like the frontier of Castile. And it's probably in the end of the 12th century that the churches of Fuente Dueña were built by the Emperor Alfonso VII. Now, the churches of Fuente Dueña are in the Romanesque style, a style which was becoming extremely fashionable throughout the north of Spain. And the kind of architecture you use becomes a very significant choice. And at a time when Castilian Christians were beginning to want to separate themselves from the wonderful, messy diversity of the Iberian Peninsula, people who lived among Muslims and Christians and Jews, if they wanted to create a separate identity that was uniquely Christian, they could look to this Romanesque style. Romanesque architecture and sculpture was the perfect way of expressing this kind of new identity. Romanesque might have come to Spain from France, but in Spain it was transformed. Transformed to take advantage of these warm stone colors and this harsh sun that cuts into the stone with these knife-like shadows, so dark and so dramatic. Romanesque architecture had sculpture, figural sculpture, with these expressive emotional images of biblical themes and cosmic judgments. Not only capitals with figures, they're corbels. Corbels are these little brackets that go around the outside of the apse. When you look more closely, you can see that they hold other images of the life of the Middle Ages. You might find a lady, or a knight, a lord, or an acrobat. In a way, the corbels show the church's attempt to draw all the life of the Middle Ages under its cloak, and they're for us a kind of precious clue about life beyond the sacred life that appears in documents and on the large part of the church decoration. Perhaps one of the reasons that the Romanesque architecture of Fuente Dueña is so good, one of the reasons it's so forceful, and one of the reasons there's so much of it, is that there were many quarries very close at hand. There was limestone, dolomite, and sandstone, all within a stone's throw of Fuente Dueña. And yet, there's kind of an anomaly here. On this high, austere plain, where the fortification of Fuente Dueña is found, was a little chapel, the Chapel of San Martin. We wonder why the Chapel of San Martin was here, and most of all, we wonder why its apse, the part of the building that's at the Metropolitan Museum today, was made with such extraordinary ashlar masonry, this big, blocky masonry, expensive, finely cut. You needed incredible craftsmen to do it. Our best guess about now is that the chapel of San Martin was originally attached to a fortification or a castle, and that that fortification was made of a different kind of material that decomposed over time. It's sort of a testament to the nature of the construction of San Martin de Fuente Dueña, how beautifully constructed it was, how expensively constructed the apse was, that it has survived when the rest of the fortification or castle to which it was attached has disappeared. Fuente Dueño was founded sometime at the end of the 11th century. The apse of San Martin represents the high moment of this settlement sometime in the 12th century. However, by the end of the 13th century, its importance wanes. By the 17th century, this proud fortification on top of this plateau where the church of San Martin once stood was in ruins. 
and the nave ceased to be used as a church at all. It begins to be used by the community as a cemetery, and that's because that nave, which had been more rudely built, had almost entirely fallen in. The place where it stood still serves as a cemetery today. The Metropolitan Museum first became interested in acquiring the Fuente Duena apse in 1935, but the negotiations stretched on for decades. Two major wars intervened, and the Met's tenacious director, James Rorimer, restarted negotiations in earnest in 1951. The Met made the case that if the apse were moved to New York City, it would be well cared for at the cloisters and accessible to millions of visitors. Ultimately, a number of Spanish government officials, even the Pope, all weighed in on the decision. The apse became a long-term loan to the Metropolitan Museum in 1957. In exchange, John D. Rockefeller Jr. provided funds to restore the church's cemetery, as well as the whole parochial church of San Miguel in Fuente Duena. And the museum loaned six important Romanesque frescoes, originally from the monastery of San Bodilio de Berlanga, which are on long-term loan to the Prado Museum in Madrid. One of the curators at the Metropolitan Museum, Carmen Gomez Moreno, was in fact the daughter of distinguished Spanish medieval art historian Manuel Gomez Moreno, who had helped to declare the Church of San Martin a national monument, and was then involved with the decision to make the loan arrangement with the museum. Carmen Gomez Moreno oversaw the process of carefully documenting and dismantling the apse at Fuente Duena on site in Spain. That is my father, Manuel Gomez Moreno, and that is the architect, Alejandro Ferrand. This architect had been doing a beautiful job in all the reconstructions, so he knew very well how to do that. And also he had a team of workers that went with him wherever he went, 11 or 12, but then they hired quite a number of people from locals. In Jaén, <coughs> I never in my life had put together anything of that sort. I never had to handle a bunch of stone workers or anything. My worry was that snow all the time. It had to be finished before December. Curiosidad es parte de la montaña para el vuelto. Se han hecho todo el vuelto, así que se han completamente a la forma de la apse para mantener la cosa juntos mientras se estaban tomando las piedras. That is where I am inside when they built it. That was a beautiful thing. It was so well made. Ferrand, he was terribly meticulous. He knew how to move things, so he knew exactly what had to be done. So they started numbering every single stone very clearly on all the visible sides. And then when they started removing them, they had numbers on everywhere. Every stone had four numbers, and that number coincided with the following number, so you knew which stone came next to it on either side. And back, there couldn't be any confusion. Oh, they were also taking note of everything they were taken down, you know. He had lists and lists and lists with all the numbers. Everything was made there. 
All the crates were made there. They brought all the plaques of wood of all kinds of sizes. And then every case had all the numbers of all the stones that were inside. So when they needed a stone here in the reconstruction, they just had to go to the crate where it was and they found it easily. If they placed them in an orderly way, you know. So it was practically a, a baby could put it together. Esta es la caja de, del santo. Y entonces esta gente llegó allí, que aquí es la, la caja del santo, que es la más grande que hay. Y, por eso y entonces estarían viendo la pues estarían viéndolo y le sacó una fotografía estarían a la gente. Contemplándola. So it was a work of a magician, the way it was packed. The stones proper, they had no problem, no? But then, the ones with carvings, the architect didn't want them to rub against anything. So they invented a, a thing that the pieces were actually hanging. They made a little carving, so it sort of fitted into the same thing in the wood and it hung, and the same goes for, for the big sculptures. They could move them and nothing happened to them, even if you threw them again distance, because you never knew what a boat is going to do with those things. Yeah, that was done with all the capitals, with everything carved. And so all the carving was preserved so precisely. Oh, it was such a difference between the, the things they used there very efficiently, and here everything was very modern and very expensive done by very clever people using the essentials in a very clever way and very well done. I think that they sent some stones cutting some mountain around to complete that part that was missing so it would be of the same kind as the rest. La iglesia de San Miguel se restauró a raíz de, de llevarse esto. Al año ha sido antes. Consecuencia de ello a parece a ser que... A llevarse aquello arreglaron la iglesia. Que dieron para, para poder arreglar la iglesia, si no igual había estado lo mismo que está ahora la iglesia de San Martín. Porque ya estaba bastante deteriorada. When it was finished, packed and loaded, I don't want to see anymore. I just left. It went by road, in trucks. And it was a very narrow road on this mountain. All that part was pretty scary. And as a result of all that, they got an abs, but I got a sort of a stomach ulcer. <laughs> 3,300 blocks and sculptural elements weighing 284 tons were shipped from Spain on the freighter Monte Navajo, which arrived in New York City on February 13, 1958. All of the blocks were treated with a preservative, and the two-year reconstruction began, overseen by Met curator Margaret Freeman. To protect the most delicate elements, casts were made of some of the exterior sculptures, and these reproductions are what you see outside while the originals are displayed inside. The final stone was put in place in January of 1960, the head of the large-scale figure of St. Martin. This is a detail that I think is very important and really crystallizes the whole process, is that the sculpture of St. Martin, the namesake of the church at Fuente Duena, had been missing its head for decades. The head had been knocked off, and in fact, the local people knew where it was, in a house in the village. And in the process, the head was joined to the pieces that came from the loan, and we now see the figure with its original head.
bringing these medieval, mostly Mediterranean monuments from Spain and France to New York presents many conservation challenges. Fortunately, we have a staff of conservators and uh, specialists who are able to look at this, and from time to time we can treat the stone and consolidate it to make sure that it's preserved. This is an old building, and an old building erodes. It has uh, uh, interaction with man that produces scratches and dings and losses, so I think uh, this, this building actually has held up fairly well with that regard. This is um, what's referred to as a dolmitic limestone, which is made of a material called calcium magnesium carbonate. A stone that's very porous, it imbibes liquids very easily, and that leads to a, a strong susceptibility for deterioration. The main conservation challenges for the building in Spain resulted from uh, the, the use of the apse and the nave as a burial area. And the bodies that were buried there, of course, ultimately decay and in that decay process produce salts that are damaging to the building stone. So these salts infiltrated through the soil and into the building stone and you could see on the exterior walls a good deal of spalling and scaling and deterioration. So that produced significant damage in Spain. The climates from Frentaduena and New York City are relatively similar uh, in that the number of freezing cycles, the number of excursions below either zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit are approximately the same. The amount of rainfall is actually fairly similar. The challenge here is that it's exposed to an urban environment. Urban environments um, have concentrations of sulfur dioxide in the air and have episodes of acid rain. The second challenge, of course, is the continuing fragility of the stone as a natural material. When confronted with a building like this, we employ different uh, analytical techniques to try to understand um, how the environment has impacted the building. So looking at the building stone by stone to say, how is this stone doing this year and how is that stone doing? So typically, we would use a technique called x-ray diffraction, which tells us about the minerals that are in the stone as well as the salts that may be present. We can examine samples from the building with scanning electron microscopy to determine the impact of biological growth and the presence of salts within the pores of the stone. As far as conservation methods are concerned, we've made some advances uh, over the last 50 years or so. Uh, in the kind of materials we use for things such as consolidation. So how do we make a stone stronger so it resists the salts, resists the freezing water, resists the acid rain? So that's maybe the one advancement that we've been able to move ahead with conservation treatments. To be honest, many of the techniques have been around for hundreds of years. The best way to clean this building is to simply spray it with fine mists of water. Uh, and that's something that's gone back for uh, perhaps millennia. If you look at some of the window openings, you'll notice that the walls uh, appear rather thick. This building is constructed by a technique which is a cavity wall construction. So it actually has two walls with an uh, air cavity in between. The entire wall is not as thick as it appears if you look through that opening, but there are two layers, an inner and an outer layer, with a backup in between. This stone contains a, a little bit of, uh, of a mineral called yellow jasper, which is just a version of quartz that gives it that wonderful warm and yellow color. I think it's one of the real attractive features of this building. To cut this stone, it's so soft you can actually cut it with a saw, which is unusual for building stone. So they would have carved these into, into or shaped these into blocks, even with something like a, a typical saw we would use for wood today, and then texture the surface with a point or a tooth chisel. Well, you notice that raking, that diagonal raking across the surface of the stone right on top of the capital? That's a good example of a drawing a scraping kind of tool across the surface. Some of the carved capitals show tremendous uh, detail and care in carving. Probably the things that are best preserved and to me are the most attractive are these band courses that course through the upper levels of the building. The way the light plays across these cavities and protuberances is really one of the gorgeous things about this building. What I love is to watch the sun rise in the east and just warm up the eastern elevation of this building and watch the sun play across the surface and the deep shadows that occur because of the texture in the stone created by the carving. Well, the cloisters really is 
the jewel of the northern tip of Manhattan, a short trip uptown from the Metropolitan Museum's main building. Without the monuments at the cloisters, to really give a sense of medieval space, medieval building techniques, medieval stone carving techniques, I think the public would really not be able to appreciate medieval art as fully as they can. The cloister's mission to teach visitors of all ages about the Middle Ages and about the architecture of the period is carried out by a very active group of education volunteers who lead these groups through and here in Fuente Duena teach about the characteristics and the function of Romanesque architecture through this apse. The apse is framed by a 70-foot long gallery that helps us imagine how an apse might have appeared at the end of a Romanesque church. This is one of the great public spaces in the cloisters. The superb acoustics work wonderfully for performances, and it's the perfect venue for the cloister's celebrated concert series of early music and medieval liturgical dramas. This is a magical setting. Whether you're listening to music, or attending a gallery talk, or just quietly enjoying the apps, I feel these are moments when the Middle Ages really comes to life for our visitors.